Welcome to Civic Engagement Media. I'm Patrick Gilbert. Hurricane Harvey brought devastation to our area, but it also brought out the best in people. We saw compassion at its finest and the emergence of many heroes. One of them is Mr. Jeff Linder. As a meteorologist with the Harris County Flood Control District, Jeff brought updates on the happenings in a calm and reassuring manner. Among many other recognitions, Jeff has been highlighted in the Wall Street Journal. Today, he is on campus here at Lone Star College Tomball. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So how are you dealing with this newfound celebrity, this newfound fame? Oh, it's certainly been interesting. Uh, you know, you can, you can go out to dinner and people come up and shake my hand and thank me and all that kind of type of stuff. But, uh, you know, to be honest with you, just like I've been saying, I was just doing my job. Um, and uh, I gave the information that I thought people would would need at that time and it, it, it boiled down to is the water rising and falling and how's it going to affect affect me at home and so that's what I tried to uh, pass along during during the updates during during the storm. So what do most people say when they see you out in the public? Do they want an autograph? Do they want to take a selfie? Yeah pictures are a big deal, selfies are a big deal, um, not so much autographs. Um, you know, thank you, thank you for everything you did, and did you get your vacation? Those are the those are the, those are the questions. No, very good ones. <laughs> so let's start with the beginning of, of who is Jeff Linda? Where are you from? I'm actually from Houston. I I was uh, born and raised in Spring. I grew up in the Spring Greenspoint area. Um, I went to Texas A&M. Uh, graduated from Nimitz High School. Then went to Texas A&M. Graduated in 2004 from A&M. I uh, was an intern for two years at Channel 11 under Dr. Neil Frank and uh, David Paul. And uh, I made some, that was when Tropical Storm Allison affected our area. And uh, I made some comments to the Flood Control District at that time that the uh, gauges weren't working very well and they said, well, come fix them. And so I, I got an internship at the Flood Control District to work on uh, some of the gauge stuff uh, that was happening and I've been there ever since. So this is my uh, 14th year with the flood control district. So you spoke up and that led to a job, huh? Yeah, speaking up can can lead to things. Yes, that's very true. So why why meteorology? What what turns you on about being a meteorologist? Well, most meteorologists will tell you that it's always been their passion. It, it starts young and I, it was the same way for me. Um, you know, back when I was in the 80s, when I was a kid, you didn't have, uh, you know, half of the stuff we have at our disposal now. Pretty much you had the, the nightly TV, so you got the weather once or twice a day uh, in the morning and the evening. And uh, then the Weather Channel came on in the late 80s, and of course, I was glued to that. It was just so incredible, awesome. Uh, and then the internet came on in the late 90s that you could you know, pretty much have weather information at your fingertips. Uh, and then to what we are today with Twitter and, and pretty much uh, all weather stuff is now available. Satellite data, model data is all available to really anybody um, who wants it just through the internet and everything. So um, it's come a long way, but yeah, this it started young and um, it's, it's been my passion ever since. So describe your role on a daily basis at the Flood Control District. What, what does Jeff Linder do? Well, my role now is completely different from my role, <laughs> from my role was uh, before Harvey. Um, but my general job is, you know, monitoring weather conditions, uh, you know, watching for potential issues, being it uh, not only flood related, but also any type of, of, of weather that could impact operations for other county agencies. For example, the Toll Road Authority, so in winter time it's ice, uh, and winter weather potential. Um, of course, flooding. Flooding is our number one natural disaster here. So we always have to be prepared for that. Hurricanes, uh, we know we get from time to time. Occasionally we have drought and wildfire. Um, that's probably the least common. Um, and then a lot of presentations, a lot of um, education on these risks and what people can do to help uh, mitigate those risks to themselves and, and having a plan and, and what you should do when local government asks for you to do this. If, if they ask you to evacuate, this is what you should do. So there's a lot of, of that type of education going on all the time. Um, and then also I operate uh, operate and maintain the uh, uh, real-time gauge network for Harris County. So we have 154 stage and rainfall gauges that report information. And so we have eight individuals that go out and work on those. So I do that too. That sounds neat. <laughs> so you came to prominence during the storm, mm -hmm. as we call it during the presentation, they were Hurricane Harvey. So this was at the end of August, or I guess kind of about the 22nd and uh, through the 26th. 
at what point did you realize that, wow, this is going to be a big deal? This is going to be bad? Um, you know, the potential was always there for Harvey to uh, strengthen in the Gulf of Mexico, and so it did. It became a Category 4 hurricane, which is, which is bad. Uh, Houston and Harris County and Southeast Texas lucked out a little bit that we didn't get a direct hit of a Category 4 hurricane. Um, but the second side of all this was always going to be the potential for these big rainfall totals. And Harvey made landfall on Friday evening and meandered around on Saturday. And up until Saturday evening, we had done very well here. We had rain, uh, we had a little bit of flooding. The biggest thing we had faced so far was tornadoes. Uh, and then things went, went sideways very quick um, Saturday night, uh, starting early in the evening. And it probably around between about midnight and 2 a.m. Sunday morning, uh, was the real realization that um, that the forecast of these unprecedented rainfall totals were going to pan out because we were starting to see it happen. Um, and then just the the enormity of what Harvey became over the next 48 hours. You know, initially this was the, the heavy rain was focused down in the southeast part of the county, Harris County, and down into Galveston County. And then over the next 24 to 36, 48 hours, it spread to all of Harris County and all the surrounding counties on top of it and, and that's just just nothing we've ever seen before here uh, and so it was it was early Sunday morning um, where where the realization set in that this was going to be something that was that was at least equal to Allison and then we quickly realized this was going to go beyond Allison I see so how long did the the storm or the hurricane linger over the Houston area so we started getting rain on Friday afternoon from the outer rain bands, and uh, we did not stop seeing rainfall until Tuesday evening, early Wednesday morning. Um, now, de now, depending on where exactly you are, that cutoff time to the north and west was a little bit sooner, but down towards the bay and certainly over to areas just to our south and east, it was into Wednesday uh, before the rain stopped. So pretty much uh, it didn't rain constantly the whole time, especially early on Saturday. And uh, even on portions of Sunday, we had these bands, so you'd get really intense rainfall and you get a break and then you get really intense rainfall again. And then Monday and Tuesday became more of a moderate to heavy rain where it just kind of rained the entire day. And so, um, yeah, that's so roughly from Friday through Tuesday was our main core of rainfall. Okay. You stated, and I remember you saying this on television toward the end of the storm, you stated that there was enough water to fill the Astrodome 3,200 times and that a trillion gallons of water fell in Harris County. Did any of this surprise you? Uh, yeah, I think, I think it did. You know, even knowing the forecast and even, uh, you know, looking at a lot of the model data that, that we had, in that time frame leading up to Harvey in that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday period before landfall, uh, some of the totals were, were just getting kind of crazy on the models. I mean, there was one model that was predicting 61 and a half inches of rain, and you know, we were like, oh, that'll never happen. And it almost did. And in some cases over in Beaumont, Port Arthur, it did happen. Um, and so, yeah, it was the, the biggest surprise with Harvey with me was not necessarily that we had the big total, it was how widespread the big totals were. Because um, we've certainly seen storms before where we've seen 30 and 40 inches of rain, but they tend to be in a very small area. You know, one portion of a county or one portion of a city gets that type of rain. Uh, but we've never seen county after county after county and city after city after city get that type of rainfall. And so I always keep coming back to, to the, the spatial enormity of Harvey is just something we've never faced before not only in Houston and Texas, but anywhere in the nation. I mean, Harvey just so far exceeds anything we've ever seen before, even in the nation. So we've had a, a number of storms that was Harvey, of course, I can few years ago, Rita, and then last year there was the tax day flood and there was the Memorial Day flood, which was you know, more so up in Brenham and the water came down this way. What are your thoughts about global warming? And of course, the vice, former Vice President Gore has come up with two movies and, and books. So what are your thoughts about that? So there's there's little debate that the the Earth is warming. I mean, I think we can all pretty much agree. Most scientists can agree on that. And uh, where the debate comes in is is why is the Earth warming? Is it is it because of a natural cycle um, that the planet's currently going through, or is it because of uh, CO two emissions that are more human induced type warming? And so 
Um, that's that's where the climate scientists really there's no hard evidence uh, either way. I mean, there, yes, there has been warming since the since the start of CO2 emissions, which um, is not surprising. It's a greenhouse gas, so if, if the more you put out there, the the warmer the planet's going to get. Um, the question is, if it's a natural cycle, there's really nothing we can do about it. It's a natural cycle. Uh, if it's CO2 inducing um, some of this warming or the majority of the warming, then potentially there is something that can be done about it. That's a policy type decision that has to be made. But um, the the question then becomes is what is the consequence of the warming? Um, you know, obviously, if you warm the Earth, and again, the data strongly supports that the Earth is warming, then clearly you get into a situation where your your polar ice caps and your glacier areas are, are going to see some melt and sea level rise, and, and we're starting to see some of that. But what does that mean for the weather, and what does that mean for everyday weather, flooding, hurricanes, that type of stuff? And that's where the the understanding of, of what's going to happen gets a little bit more blurry because, um, you know, we've only been around on this planet with reliable records in the U.S. for about 150 years, which is a snapshot in time on a, on a scale of climate. And so... Uh, it's very hard to use current trends and try to extrapolate them out because there could have been times when the earth has been even warmer than we're at now. Um, and what, what was the result of that and what caused that and, and all that type of stuff. And then there also could have been times um, where we don't understand why some of the stuff is happening that's happened. We don't always have all the answers. And I think that's, that's a, a legitimate answer uh, even in today, and you know, today everybody wants answers, but we don't always have the answers. When we deal with science um, and some of these unknowns, there just sometimes isn't an answer to some of it. But um, what that means going forward for rainfall, there's certainly the. I mean, just if you look at the very basics of how weather and water operate, uh, warmer planet, more moisture in the air, potentially higher rain. That that's a valid potential with this, and so. Could we get more rain? Yes, we could. Does it mean we'll have more Harveys? I wouldn't go that far, um, but certainly we could be seeing more rainfall. Okay, thank you for that explanation. <laughs> <laughs> we need that information. We need that, that, that knowledge, Jeff, so definitely. Here's a big question. Okay, we have bayous. Bayou is kind of a creek, in other yes. words. Okay, okay, so we have bayous. We have the, the San Jacinto River the Brazos River, and all of that flows to basically to the Gulf of Mexico. That's where it's going to eventually end up. So the question then becomes, so we have all these ways to get the water out. Why did Houston flood? Uh, so the reason we have flooding here is, is a multiple part answer. Um, one, one is what we have been dealt, meaning our topography. We're on the flat coastal plain of Texas, not all that different from Louisiana. We're not as marshy as Louisiana. We do have a little bit more topography or, or elevation rise in Louisiana. Um, but we're still relatively flat. Our ground rises about a foot per mile. So that's, that's pretty flat. Um, on top of that, we get just incredible rainfalls here. Um, it's, it's not that uncommon for us to get four, five, six inches of rain in an hour. And there's not a lot of places, certainly in the United States, that get that kind of rainfall. That's really a Gulf Coastal and Florida type uh, area that get that. Um, there's other places in the world that certainly get that, but those are areas that are much less populated than we are here in, in the Southeast Texas area. And so uh, those two things alone uh, are two things we have no control over. The rainfall we get and the topography that we have here. And so we have issues with that. And so. Um, what we have, what we try to do is try to get water out as quickly as possible. Um, and what we can't get out, we try to store. So in detention basins, um, and, and hopefully keep it out of the homes. And, you know, there's, there's development, uh, procedures in place to cut the streets down in new subdivisions, to store water in the streets. The streets act as a secondary, um, stormwater storage system for us to get the water to the bayou and to get the water out of the bayou and creek as fast as we possibly can. We try to get rid of water as fast as we can around here. Um, the problem is, is we will get rainfalls like Memorial Day 15, Tax Day 16, Memorial Weekend 16, and certainly Harvey, that exceed the ability of our channels to drain it. 
Um, it's the same concept in New Orleans. Uh, they have to pump all their water because they're below sea level. And if it rains more than the pumps can handle, the city begins to flood. Uh, it's, it's sort of the same concept here. We don't pump water, but if it rains more than the bayous and the underground drainage systems can handle, then the water starts to flood the surrounding areas. And unfortunately, sometimes it, it gets into the homes. Great. That's a good explanation. It's part of this, and, and I'm asking this question because there's, all, of course, there's a lot of development that's going on mm -hmm. in places that were bills. So is part of this uh, situation that's going on with the, the homes flooding and such, well, I just, let me just ask the question directly. Do certain places need not be developed? I would probably answer that question that certain places probably should not have been developed. Um, meaning the first the first floodplain maps uh, that came out for Harris County were back in the early 1980s and a lot of the city of Houston Harris County had developed prior to 1980 and that is where we see a lot of our flood problems today we see a lot of these homes that were built in the 50s 60s and 70s they're the homes that flood they're very deep in the floodplain um, they would never be built today there and if they were built there today they would be way up in the air and so um, that's the, the, the straight question, or the straight answer to that question. The, um, a statistic to go along with that is we had about 30,000 homes flood in unincorporated Harris County with Hurricane Harvey. And of those 30,000, 750 were built after 2009. So the majority of the homes that flooded in unincorporated Harris County were built before current building standards were in place. And so, uh, you have, even for an event like Harvey, which far exceeded building standards and scales around here, even homes that are built after 2009 did fairly well. Um, it, it's, the, it's the infrastructure that is, has been built and put in place, um, you know, decades ago that now we're trying to have to go back and mitigate those areas and, and try to remove them either from the floodplain with structural solutions, detention basins, increasing channel capacity, all that type of stuff. Or in some cases, there, there's just no structural solution and the, and the, and the end result is, is home buyout, property acquisition. We remove that, prop, remove that property, nothing's ever built there again, and it can never flood again. And that's the flood control district that buys that property, correct? It's the flood control district does some purchasing. FEMA also uh, produces a lot of funds to, produce, uh, to acquire a lot of those homes. Okay, and then I'm, as you're answering that, I'm, I'm wondering, when a person buys a home that was built prior to a certain year, do you think they're told, hey, this is in a floodplain, this is a very good chance that it may flood, so buyer beware, are they, are they told that? So if you buy a house and it's within the 100 year floodplain, um, you are required to carry federal flood insurance. So uh, your mortgage company is gonna tell you that because they want their investment taken care of. Um, if you buy a house that is not within the 100 year floodplain, uh, you are not required to have uh, flood insurance and even though the seller is supposed to disclose if a house was ever flooded I've certainly seen cases where people do not do that because a lot of these homes that flooded they, they were very expensive homes and very you know, well-to-do areas if I may say that and I just you know I just wonder hey were they told that yes it's an expensive home but chances are this may happen so uh, some of the areas that flooded uh, especially along portions of Buffalo Bayou and behind the reservoirs those homes had never flooded before and so this is the first time uh, for some of these homes to to take on water again it goes back to the responsibility of the seller of that house when they decide to sell it to disclose that yes this house was flooded but there's no uh, to my knowledge there's no uh, policy or anything in place that makes people to have to do that. Is there a way for those who may tune into this at some point in time, is there a way for a, a home, a prospective home buyer to go and look on their own and, and some sort of database where they can see, okay, this house flooded before, no, I'm not going to buy this? There's not any, any way to look up if homes have flooded before. You can certainly look up, uh, even on the Flood Control District website, uh, the flood education mapping tool we have allows you to type in an address and it'll uh, show how if you're in a floodplain or if you're not in a floodplain how close you are to a floodplain uh, so that, that'll give you that information FEMA is another resource you can go to to look up mapping but let me just say this um, to be blunt about it we all have a flood risk 
if you're in a floodplain or you're not in a floodplain, we all have a flood risk. And everybody, regardless of where you buy a house, if you're not in a floodplain, you should still carry flood insurance. So you fully recommend flood insurance? Fully recommend flood insurance. And 100%. he doesn't get a cut for saying that. Sure does. <laughs> so. That's backed by the federal <laughs> government and FEMA. Okay. Is, so is there any specific place that you know of that the flood control district would say, do not buy a home in this area? No, there's no specific places like that. Um, you know, if you're in the in the San Jacinto River, I, I'd probably not buy that. Um, you know, some of, some of this kind of boils down a little bit to common sense and and some responsibility on the buyer's part. Uh, you know, there's some subdivisions of the San Jacinto River um, that we're actually going to the county is going in and buying all the subdivision out now because the water with Hurricane Harvey got up over the roofs and. You know, the, the, the roadway into this area has been completely destroyed. Um, you're sending first responders in there and you're taking boats over the top of power lines. It, it's just not safe. And, um, you know, some of these areas that have been flooded 10 and 15 times, um, you know, that, that's just not an area that, that, that we should have structure and infrastructure in. Uh, the San Jacinto River, the, the portion down there around Banana Bend, below Lake Houston, that's one of those areas. Uh, there's some portions on the West Fork of the San Jacinto River just downstream of uh, Highway 59, east of Highway 59, uh, or there's homes right on the riverbank. And, uh, you know, in Harvey, some of them are washed away. And I don't know if people are going to come back in there and try to rebuild or not. But, uh, you know, at some point, you just have to, we just can't build here. And, and we, if you are here, we just can't sustain services here anymore. Um, and so, uh, the San Jacinto River is probably one of those that I would certainly caution people in that. I'm talking about the area like down right on the riverbanks, not not a mile or two from the river. Um, you know, portions of Kingwood that flooded from the San Jacinto River, Harvey was an exception. That's some of the first time some of those areas have flooded. Others have flooded in 1994. Um, but other than that, uh, no. Okay, our Kingwood campus took a big hit. Yeah. And they're, they're still... Uh, dealing with that. So during the hurricane, where were you? So I was at Houston Transtar, and that's that's the emergency operations hub of the county. And so I get deployed over there along with a, a, a team of flood control individuals that go over there. And then we also have a team of uh, up to 20 people that work back at our office. That's about a mile and a half from Transtar. Um, so I'm over at Transtar, they're at, at uh, the Flood Control District office and we operate a phone bank over there. They had about 15,000 calls into that phone bank over a three-day period, so just an enormous workload that happens with something like Harvey. Uh, and then Transtar's its own, its own. Do their own thing. Its own thing, yeah. So it's like the command center in a certain type of way. So what is it like in the command center? Is it chaotic or is everybody calm and relaxed? You know, it goes... Um, it goes up and down with the uh, with what's happening. Um, you know, Harvey was I'd been there for a lot of storms. I was there for Ike, all the floods we've had since then, and Harvey was probably the the longest. Um, it's not the I don't think it's the longest time we've spent activated, but it's the the longest time we've spent in just a very tense, serious situation. And so from really Saturday night through about Wednesday, uh, it, was, it was some really intense focus going on in there. And some, some really critical decisions had to be made uh, by multiple agencies and multiple people working in that room, elected officials, um, and all that coordination with other counties, and everything goes out and through there. And even though you, it's, it's supposed to be the place where you have the most information sometimes you're almost void of information because you're in this room like almost like this with no windows no seeing if the sun's shining outside or it's, it's pouring rain and so even though you have the most information at your fingertips of probably anybody sometimes you just don't know what's going on and, and so we call that uh, uh, situational awareness of, of the situation that's going on um, so it's a, it's a very interesting place to work. Um, there's a lot of good uh, professional people that work there, and certainly we could not have come through Harvey the way we came through it without, without those individuals. We had about 600 people working in there. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. Is it made the whole that many people? There's 98 seats. So. Did you all sleep there? 
Absolutely, we slept there. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, some people that live that live close enough and could get home would go home and, and sleep a few hours and come back. Um, I stayed for five days straight, pretty much, and I slept for about five hours in five days. I, I heard you slept seven hours, but I guess it's less than that. <laughs> seven or five? <laughs> no, but yeah. no, but it means you they they overestimated here, so you got less. <laughs> How are you able to function like that? You know, I don't know. Um, when I did Ike back in two thousand eight, I went forty seven hours straight with no sleep, and I was I was fine with that. I'm I'm older now. I'm ten years older now, and so uh, you know, I could feel when I was starting to. Um, your speech is probably one of the first things that starts to go. You start to uh, mm -hmm. slur your words a little bit, and so I knew it when I kind of started to get to that level, I needed to go get a, get an hour of sleep or something in a chair and uh really the thing honestly that helped more than anything was a shower i mean just a, it just woke you up and rejuvenated you and and got you going again and so um i think the other thing is adrenaline will carry you a long way and to be honest with you i know five hours over five days and it, it sounds like very little sleep but i think most people put in similar circumstances can probably go without sleep more than they think they can they, oh, wow. yeah, when you're in that situation, you know, ask people whose homes were floating. They didn't sleep. They were up, worried about what was going to happen. I don't think anybody really slept good here in this entire region for, for three or four days because you're either worried the water's going to come in your house or you have water in your house. You can't sleep when there's water in your house. That's a good point. And so I think we all were a little bit sleep deprived, but you'd be surprised when you're put in, in certain situations how long you can go without sleep. So, th so this... Well, I call it a situation room now. So, you know, that's a little more official. It had what you needed. It had the facilities, and you all weren't there eating crackers and water. I mean, you had which what, what you needed there. Oh, absolutely. We had we had uh, showers. We had bunks. Um, we had a uh, for a hurricane event. They have a cooking team that comes on site and and secures the facility. So they they're in there with us. We had the media downstairs. They they sleep and eat with us also, so they're kind of part of the the team there. Um, and then we had all these we had all these individuals. And so the 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 idea for all this is you operate twelve hour shifts, and um, it sort of works that way, and then it sort of doesn't. There's there are certain people who kind of operate all the time, and then there are certain people um, that will follow that twelve hour shift type thing, the turnover. But the biggest problem we faced, like especially on that Sunday and Monday, was you really couldn't get anybody in and out. I mean, you just, the flooding was so significant that you couldn't go from even the heights to Transtar, and Transtar is right there off of uh, I-10 in Washington, or even maybe the Galleria and Transtar. So even areas that were close, you just couldn't get access. And you, I mean, if you were further out, forget it, Katy or, or uh, Dickinson, Clear Lake, there's no way you're gonna make it in, so. So how about Tomball, since that's where we're at now? Mm -hmm. Did it fare a little better than most places? Tombo actually did for Harvey fared um, probably yeah absolutely better than than a lot of places fared and the majority of that comes down to your rainfall up here and your rainfall rates were more more manageable um, compared to the southeast part of the county uh, this area actually had a little bit worse flooding last Memorial weekend Memorial weekend 16 when you had the uh, core of heavy rain right on the upper end of the Spring Creek watershed and so all that water came down into the into the Tomball area and you had significant flooding from that. Uh, you certainly had flooding with Harvey but with respect to structure flooding it wasn't as significant up here in the northwest part of the county as it was maybe in the western part certainly in the eastern and southern parts of the county that's where a lot of the uh, structure flooding occurred. Okay. People have said all sorts of good things about you on Twitter. Uh, Nancy says, you are the most important person in the world to me for a solid three days, and I have never even met you. Giga Maggie's. <laughs> Carlos said, Jeff, write a book about this situation and your experience. Seriously, I'd buy the audio book. And I, I'm going to co-sign with Carlos. You should write a book. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so here's my next question. How did you get selected to be the, the news person, the one to deliver the news? Mm -hmm. uh, well... I don't know. Um, I I had actually I started doing the media type stuff from Transtar during Hurricane Ike, and I did a lot during Hurricane Ike. I guess nobody saw it because the power was out. 
So, yeah. <laughs> so that that must have been it for, with for Ike because I was on quite a bit explaining Storm Surge. Ike was a big Storm Surge event for us, and and there was a lot of confusion about uh, how was the water rising from the coast when the sun was still shining. And so there was a lot of explanation that went into that. And then I've certainly been doing media um, and interviews with all the floods we've had recently. Um, I, I don't. I think the difference for Harvey is that Harvey was the only thing anybody cared about for four days. Um, pretty much everybody's life stopped for four days. Um, if you wanted it to or not, you couldn't, you know, move around very easily. So you were pretty much stuck at home. Uh, it was the only thing that was on the TV. Um, and so I guess a lot of people saw me um, out there, and um, apparently I resonated with people. That's what I've been told, anyways. Um, <laughs> But how I got picked is, is, is it was just kind of the natural progression that since I'm the meteorologist for the county, we're dealing with a weather event, I'm going to have a very prominent role. And, and then it turned into this, this, uh, this big flood situation. Um, and, you know, my director was sitting right there with me and he goes, you know, you're doing a good job. Why change it or why have anything different happen? And so what's going to be interesting going forward is, is uh, you know, the reliance on me going forward the next time we have a weather event. Hmm. Well, hopefully I'll be here, I guess. Ooh, yes, <laughs> I hope so, right? <laughs> so President Trump came down, that's about this, uh, September 2nd. Were you there at, at the airport when he arrived? He, uh, he came down to Ellington, and uh, yes, we were, we were taken down to Ellington to uh, meet with him. But in the end, we didn't get to meet with him. What happened? He uh, he got off. There was a change with the uh, schedule, so he got directly off the aircraft and and, and the office of Air Force One and got in the motorcade and left. So, sorry. Which is that's kind of how things work with with presidential visits, though. Things change last minute. So, but I got to see the plane. Did you get any pictures? That, that was. Would they oh, let you take pictures? Oh, of absolutely. It? Very impressive. So you got to send us yeah. some pictures. Maybe we can include it in the in this video. Yeah. After the storm. Mm -hmm. So even though you didn't get to meet President Trump, GoFundMe did raise $21,350 for you to take a vacation. And Blake Ford, who set it up, he said he just looks like he knows his stuff and gives off a frankly fantastic vibe. He had an answer ready for every question, every follow-up, and never once dodged a difficult question, nor was he afraid to honestly inform the public of imminent trouble. Then it also said, due to his status as a government employee, Jeff is not allowed to accept gifts over one hundred dollars. So, what did you end up doing with twenty-three thousand or twenty-one thousand dollars? Yeah. So, um, first off, I can't believe people raised twenty-one thousand dollars to send me on vacation. That's hey, just that's, that's just beyond me. Um, but you know, obviously, as a government employee, I can't accept that, and I wouldn't have accepted it anyways because there's there's certainly individuals that need this money way more than I need to go on a vacation. Uh, and so I got that money out of the GoFundMe and put it in a, a nonprofit and uh, I've been distributing that money to the, the flood victims and I just go knock on, I, I kind of know where the flooding happened and so I, I just go knock on the door. I have no idea who's going to answer. I have no idea if they have flood insurance or not. Um, I, I don't know their situation and I, you know I either give them a 500 or a thousand dollar gift card. and I. I I think I've passed out so far about fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars of that, so I have a little bit left. That, that's great. That's great. I did see that on Twitter somewhere. Right. Where you were giving that money, you were going to their homes. And, and that was one thing I I wanted to make sure that it I put it on Twitter. I put the faces on Twitter so people know exactly where their money's going because I, I think a lot of people give during stuff like this to organizations and they never know where the money goes in the end. You know, mm -hmm. here we are, you know, ten weeks after the storm. People have given millions and millions of dollars. Where did they go? I don't know. And you know, that's that's for those organizations. But I wanted to put it out there that this this is your money. This isn't my money. This is the people of this region who raised this money. This is your money, and this is who it's going to help. So GoFundMe cut a check to you or Blake Ford, and that's how I was able to get out. So it, it uh, GoFundMe. I pulled the money out of GoFundMe and put it into the 501. Nonprofit, and then I've been able to pull the money out of that to go buy the gift cards. That's very nice. And I figured the gift cards are the best way because I don't know who's going to answer the door. <laughs> I don't have their name. There you go. 
There was a lot of talk about you and your family and your home during the hurricane. I remember a lot of people were asking you, well, how much damage did your house sustain? And it was kind of some uncertainty. So did your house sustain any damage? No, my house was fine. Um, <coughs> we live we live in the spillway area of Attics, so the north spillway that was engaged. Um, and the water did get into the subdivision, it got into the streets, but none of the homes in my particular subdivision flooded and my house didn't flood, so we were fine. We, we didn't have power for a long time, um, I guess because the underground system was damaged, but the uh, I had sent my wife and family out of town that, that Friday before, and okay. um, my, my parents have a place up in Smithville, and I said, you know, y'all go up there and stay, you know, if things are fine on Sunday, you come back, and we'll all go back to normal on Monday, right? Well, we all know how things worked out, and so they were actually up there for uh, for much of the that week uh, following Harvey because it wasn't that the house was was damaged or we just didn't have any power. And if you have a three and a five year old, then without them living without power is just yeah, that's so a big no no. That's yeah. If I can go back for a second, I know we're almost done. I want to be respectful of your time, but would you talk just just a little about the decision to to uh, let the water out of the attics and Barker reservoirs? Yeah. So, just to be clear about this, the the Attucks and Barker flood control reservoirs are operated and maintained by the Army Corps of Engineers. So they are the agency uh, responsible for operating them. That means making releases and maintaining them, making sure the integrity of dams and everything uh, are in place and everything. And so uh, they had made that decision on on that Sunday evening um, that that water releases were going to be required out of those reservoirs. So it wasn't you that made the decision, it was the Corps of Engineers? Correct, the Corps of Engineers. Okay. I, I helped report it. And so uh, I think there's a lot of, there might be some confusion that since I was the person in the media saying it, um, I was the one making the decision. But the decision, the operation of that is by the Corps of Engineers. Okay. Well, I like clearing up, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, clearing up misconceptions. So you are married, correct? Mm -hmm. You did say that. How does your wife feel about your newfound celebrity? Um, and your kids too. I think she's kind of done with it, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, she's she's not one kind of for the the spotlight uh, and all that. Uh, my kids don't care; they're too young. Um, they'd rather watch cartoons and, and do whatever. They, my oldest five year old, she'll be six in here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, she has a little bit more understanding of what's going on, but um, you know, since they were out of town in Smithville, they didn't see a lot of the coverage because um, it wasn't being carried on the Austin TV stations really and so uh, they kind of missed that whole thing um, but yeah. What's next for you Mr. Linder? <laughs> <laughs> um, right now there's there's uh, no big plans you know I've been with the county for um, going on 14 years and so uh, I certainly have enjoyed working for the county. I certainly enjoy the position. Uh, I enjoy the opportunity to be able to um, educate folks and help people uh, during these events um, where you become to rely on a meteorologist that on an everyday aspect is do I wear a long sleeve short or a shorts today and when it gets serious like something like a, a Hurricane Harvey uh, it becomes kind of in some cases a life and death situation for some people and so um, there's a great responsibility to be had in being able to pass along information that's helpful to people. Um, so but beyond that, I don't know. You think about writing a book? Uh, I haven't thought about writing a book, no. Um, if, if I did, it would probably be down the road a little bit after all my speaking engagements. <laughs> Well, uh, allow me some time. <laughs> if you write the book, will you come back here? Sure, absolutely. Sounds like a deal to absolutely. me. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I thank appreciate you for the time. it. And thank you for joining us on Civic Engagement Media.